So here's a, a quick agenda of, um, of our, our presentation. Uh, but overall, the intent that I want to share with you guys is that BIM for Energy Modeling is a simple and a simple process, and it can be learned by applying uh, specific modeling techniques. And we're going to cover those techniques. But overall, as long as you know that, that you can do it, uh, I've been teaching many students all over the world on how to do it, so it's, uh, it can be very straightforward and, and not as overwhelming. Um, although the topic of this presentation is that once once you're able to do a, an integration, a BIM integration at the first level, um, there's many more opportunities to keep um, going forward with, and that's kind of been the, the core of my research. So we're going to start off, we're going to cover the concept for interoperability. Um, we're going to get into some BIM project planning, because that kind of gels it all together. Um, we're going to do an overview of the energy modeling integration. And then we're going to cover the five modeling techniques that, uh, that I use every single time to, to create a perfect integration. Uh, then we're going to get into the bidirectional data exchange loop. And then we're going to talk a little bit about IFC and the, uh, the data dictionary. So some of the parameters we're being, we've been using, uh, we're trying to uh, correlate them with uh, interoperable standards. So before we get started, um, I don't want to get you guys overwhelmed, but uh, but once, once you get started with this, you'll see that there's, there's about three levels to it. Start off, there's the BIM integration portion. If you want to take a BIM model um, and integrate into the VE, uh, you know, great. You know, that'll work just fine, and, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. But as you can keep moving forward, then you'll see that you can start to exchange data back and forth. And, and Doug kind of touched on that topic uh, at first. And, uh, and then, then now, now that you're able to exchange data, um, you're able to collaborate with your team. You're able to say uh, who's in charge of which which pieces of data, uh, who's in charge of authoring them or updating them and, and whatnot. And uh, and then you can really embed yourself more into the team and uh, and there's much more opportunity. But just remember that there's many levels to it and uh, they're all kind of a prerequisite to each other. So you can't you can't necessarily quite jump to the uh, to the collaborative team just yet, but uh, but it's something that you can work on um, step by step. So a little bit about myself. Um, so this is a company trail loop that I started. Um, we're uh, based in Ottawa, and it's a building performance consulting and education company. And uh, mainly we've been uh, creating uh, workflows, uh, energy modeling workflows, to, uh, to create online courses, to uh, help the industry execute these processes. So uh, I work with, uh, with schools, um, with uh, private workshops, um, seminars, and um, and a lot of uh, standard agencies and governments to uh, to really to set set the standards and uh, and go forward together as as an industry. So at a high level, um, this is uh, interoperability in the design process. So I've I've created an integrated workflow that, uh, that you know kept it very simple um, to produce your building loads and your system sizing. Um, so how, how this diagram works is that we've got this, the schematic design is, is typically where we start off to, to build your, your building loads. You know, you've got space planning, you're doing a space-by-space -space model, not a zone-based model. Um, and then you kind of migrate over to detail design, and that's where you start doing your, your system sizing. Uh, what I typically, you know, I've seen with the industry is that you've got, um, you know, the initial model is done to produce your building loads, and then you, you know, you take that. And, uh, and then you, you size your system accordingly. But what, what ends up happening is that the building ends up changing over this you know, process, sometimes two month, three month long process, or even greater. Um, and then you know, the building load never gets updated, and your systems are still being sized according to these you know, out of date loads. And, uh, and then you know, throughout this whole process, at the end, you know, we're, we're being asked to create you know, a lead you know, compliance report or an ASHRAE 90.1 model. And then the model just gets kind of rebuilt at the end. And so you have kind of, you know, typically two models, one at the beginning, one at the end, which are both, you know, not related to each other. They're, they're both very, very different. And, uh, you know, one has a lot more detail, the other one's kind of more simple. Um, so the, the process is um, that, you know, we, we start off, we define the requirements for the first phase, the schematic phase, and then you produce your building loads, which is your, your outcomes. Um, and then the goal is to exchange that information um, and, and make it as a prerequisite for your next phase's requirements, your detailed design phase. 
and, and this information is you know builds upon your systems and and vice versa and there's this kind of iterative loop um, and once you're able to to move that information across and continue continuously update it you're able to um, to you know keep this model going through from from the beginning all the way to the end and uh, and keep it updated and, and make sure that your systems are being sized according to accurate loads that are continuously being refined throughout the whole process you know because sometimes when you start off a project in schematic you don't have much time to to you know to prepare your loads uh, but throughout the the whole process uh, you get a, you get around to, uh, to updating it so so this is kind of a, a high level approach um, this is kind of a, a project planning uh, form that I use um, and it sets a bit of the context as to where where you can start to head um, a lot of people use a BIM execution plan to get started on a BIM project. Um, it helps everyone understand and break down each phase. Um, so you can start off your conceptual phase, your schematic phase, uh, and all that. Um, and that information is all based on your project goals. So depending on what you want to achieve with your building, you know whether you want to do um, a daylight autonomous building, or you want to put natural ventilation, or you just want to explore active systems or passive systems or whatever it may be, uh, that's great. You know we should all support those types of goals but when you put those goals in it obviously dictates what your requirements are and so once you know what your requirements are then you're able to uh, to assign whoever the stakeholder may be whether the architect or the engineer um, they might have to further define um, you know a little bit more information on the windows on the glazing or on on the lighting systems and uh, and at what phase and so this is where you, you define what needs to happen at what phase to what level of detail um, and once you have all this information, you're able to progress forward um, as a team, as a one solid unit, so that um, you know you are, as the energy modeler, are able to have the right information and do do the job and um, and provide the right feedback at the right time. And then you're able to track and update these measures throughout the whole process and see how they're performing, and see how your building is getting better and better throughout the whole process. So. Um, so this is kind of a quick overview of uh, the BIM execution plan. Um, so this is kind of the, the latest research that we've been doing. Uh, we've been defining information requirements from the schematic design to detail design. So it kind of builds on that uh, initial uh, diagram that I showed you. Uh, except this time I've broken it down into uh, three roles. We've got the architect, the engineer, and the modeler. And what, what you know, typically what ends up happening is that the modeler usually does all these steps together. Uh, but you see, uh, at first I kind of mentioned there was those three levels. Once you get to the third level of, of integration, you're able to decentralize the process and now collaborate with the team and, uh, and have a little more engagement, a little more disclosure. Um, and, and in theory, you know, the whole point of BIM is so that you know, the architect is the one that defines the building geometry. Um, it shouldn't be up to the modeler to rebuild and, uh, and you know, build an exact duplicate of this building so that they can you know, put it into the energy model. So in theory, if, if we can get the, the architect engaged early and defining this geometry, you know, he can pass it off to the engineer where they have to specify the building description, um, you know, whatever, however it's going to perform, they pass it off to the engineer, we produce the loads, and then we share that information back into um, to the BIM process. And then you, you know, the process continues. If, if that is not satisfactory, you go back and you continue this loop and you keep getting it um, updating it until it's right. So once you have these loads, then you can progress forward into finalizing the building design. And again, you have this, this same process that happens. You, know, you select and size the mechanical systems based on those loads. And again, once the systems are, are sized and selected, then the energy model can uh, estimate the energy use and the peak demand and then send in your, your, your compliance reports. So whether that's a an ASHRAE 90.1 report or um, you know whatever the, the client may need as a submission but uh, so overall this is kind of a two very high level approaches but I think in between the, de the detailed design and the compliance report you may have you know three four five iterations um, you may want to choose multiple systems uh, once you choose a system you may want to optimize that system and and drive it you know deeper and deeper so this is why it's a uh, it's, it's a very large process, but uh, we can keep breaking it down step by step. Um, this is kind of a, a small sidestep, 
but it's just, uh, you know, how, how do we integrate this, you know, BIM into the design process? And, uh, and I think one of the notion that, that we have right now, and, and this is, this, I mean, I'm, I typically teach in Canada, um, but I, I, how we teach architects is, uh, is typically how um, we should build in a, in a coordination clash detection environment. So we, we teach them to, to build in a coordinated environment, which is not what we need for an energy model. You know, we need a very simple model, one that has complete enclosures and uh, you know, no gaps and, and things like that. So what ends up happening is that the, you know, the submissions or the files that the architects typically submit aren't necessarily bad. Um, they're just more well suited for their own purpose and uh, there is no consideration for energy modeling. So what ends up happening is that you have this file that goes from a level zero to about level 300, which is you know, construction documentation type of um, detail. And you can pass this off to the energy modeler. What ends up happening is that you need to reduce the level of detail back down to 150 to a more simplistic model, um, which is fine. I mean, it needs to be done. Either you, you build the model up from scratch, from nothing, or you adapt it from BIM. But either way, there's work involved here. And, uh, and that's the, you know, the state of it right now. The opportunity going forward is that if you want to use an integrated BIM, is that you can have, like I was mentioning, the architect build the model. Um, the architect can start to build off this, this simple model. And these simple models are very easy to build. Um, they're not cumbersome. They're not hard to do. They're not complex. Um, so there's a natural progression that, that can happen from the, the early stage to the, to the schematic level design. Once, once you're able to get that, that submission at that early stage, hopefully using your BIM execution plan, then you're able to pass off this model and then create a very quick integration, um, even of, of large models. Um, and this, this quick integration allows the energy model, modeler to give very quick feedback. Um, and, and that engagement really happens a lot earlier, a lot faster. Then the architect can continue to evolve that model to a class detection level um, that they need. Uh, but at least the, the modeler is able to grab that integration and, uh, and do their work very early. So this is, there, there's a large opportunity here, um, and that's, it, it only is going to happen with the, the engagement of, of the whole team. So once you're able to, uh, to create that initial engagement or that, that initial integration, um, it's, it's an iterative approach. So, the first, you know, the whole goal of energy modeling is you know, first you build your model, you can exchange that information with your design team if you'd like, and then you analyze and, and you incorporate that feedback. But after that feedback, um, the whole intent is that you can update the model and keep, uh, keep going. You refresh your data set, compare your results, and you refine the energy model, um, and, and so on and so on. So it's an iterative open loop. And that's the whole intent of doing energy modeling early um, and doing it quickly. So that, um, you know, with this process, it's a managed process, um, I'm able to tell my clients that I can give you feedback by the end of the week, if not by the end of, you know, tomorrow or the, the next day. Because it's a process that as long as you, you know, especially if you build the geometry for me, I'm able to just re-import it, update the data, and then and resend the, um, the information. So it's, it can be very quick and very easy. And, um, and the opportunity is that you're able to drive down and, you know, deeper into energy efficiency a lot quicker. So some quick high-level um, you know, reasons as to why you want to use BIM for BIM for, for building energy modeling. Um, at first, you've got, you know, you've got the synergy that you can get from collaborating with your team, with, with, the, with the engineer, with the architect. Everyone knows what's going on, and, um, and everyone has an input. Um, there are some productivity benefits. So building um, energy models using Revit, um, especially at a, at a large scale. So once you get over about 500 to, uh, to 700 spaces, um, using you know model or SketchUp um, is you know can be a bit slow when you start using Revit. You got structure. You have you know modeling tools here. You can really get very productive, especially if you're doing iterations. Once you start doing uh, different options, um, then the productivity you know skyrockets because uh, managing those updates in, in other tools can be very cumbersome. And, and this and using Revit for a modeling tool is gets very very easy. Um, and that leads to the next uh, benefit is the design iteration, the fact that you can uh, quickly reintegrate this information. Um, there's a sense of transparency so that you can 
share this information, you can get feedback from your team so that if I say, you know, there's there's 40 occupants in this conference room and the architect says, no, there's 30, um, great, you know, I'm glad I got that feedback. So now I can bring that information back in um, in, a, in a way that's, you know, it's very seamless and uh, everyone's in, on the same page. Um, so the next benefit is, is on management. Um, so I, I work with, you know, on, on very large projects, you know, over, uh, you know, 300 to 500,000 square feet. Uh, sometimes we need a few a few team members, so I, I can, you know, with Revit we can work share. We can share the information. We can get people to, uh, you know, isolate the information of radiators, or we can get people working on modeling. We get people on the HVAC system. Um, so we, so it's very very uh, efficient for for your time and for your team. And uh, finally is interoperability. So uh, not only does this work you know well with with the VE, but it works well with with any other tool. So it's a simple process. Um, so if you wanted to uh, to exchange information with uh, you know, with any client or with any contractor, then you know this process works. So um, to define, I guess this is we're going to start off the uh, the first phase is the integration level one phase is what I call it, and and this level one um, you know is this kind of the levels I would find, but it also correlates with the uh, the UK's level two BIM as in it's not level two yet. Um, this, this integration process is the first step. It's a prerequisite step in achieving level two, but it's not there yet. So um, the first integration process can be perceived as, you know, doing a, a save as and, and bringing that information in. But in order to achieve that level two, you got to bring the information back. You need to be able to share and collaborate. And uh, you guys are probably familiar with, with this, this term, the level two term is, um, to create a, a single environment to, to store and shared asset data and information. Um, and so it's it's something that you have to have this, this collaborative BIM environment. Um, so the first, the first step is very important, but many more to come. And so what I've done is I've, I've authored the, uh, the five modeling techniques for a perfect integration. And like you see here, it, it's, this process works you know, for IES, but also for many other tools using GBXML. Um, and the reason is that we're, we're pre-processing the GBXML file so that it works perfectly um, with the VE, but also with any other tool. So um, the, five, the five techniques are um, center lines, um, simplicity, precision, completeness, and hierarchy. And I'll be, I'll be breaking that down with a little more detail in, in the slides to come. So here are some project examples. Um, these are some projects I've done in Alberta. Um, you know, you can use complex geometries, large-scale commercial. Um, I've done intricate open atriums. Those are the toughest ones to pull off, but uh, you know, it still works. You can do slope floors and roofs. Um, you know, again, it's it's uh, every time you're doing one one type of element, you're you're you know you you need to address them individually. But uh, so far, everything's been possible and. Uh, was able to work. So we start off with the uh, with the center line. So the center line is um, the way that it works is uh, let me just uh, oh, there we go proceed forward. Um, so how it works is that you've got the you know typically the original wall or the the intent the proposed wall you know that could be uh, you know whatever maybe it could be a foot wide or, or 300 millimeters. Um, but what I, I typically start off with is, you know, defining where you need the analytical line to be. The analytical line is what gets exported as per the GBXML process. And this analytical line is always going to be in the center line of the wall. And so what I end up doing is I, I create, you know, a wall for integration. Um, I, I usually reduce the thickness of this wall, um, bring it down to 50 millimeters or a few, just a few inches. Uh, because at that point, at this early stage, you're not really going to know what the thickness really is of the wall. So might as well use something that's very small, very manageable, and uh, and that's easy to manipulate. But it's when you have different um, thicknesses of walls. Say you have a wall that's you know 50 millimeters that joins itself to a wall that's that's 300. Um, the center lines of those walls are going to be very very different, and that's how it gets exported. So you need to align those center lines together, and when you have one simple wall for the whole building, it just gets very easy to, uh, to connect things together. Um, but in this case, if you wanted to, uh, it is recommended 
that uh, you place this analytical line, line on the finished face interior of the wall. So here I've got it on the finished face exterior. So that would be a, an incorrect way. It, it, you can still do it if you wanted to uh, turn on your, your room volumes um, and your thicknesses. So if you're doing an energy audit and you wanted to know the thermal massing of the wall, you could place it here. But in all other cases, I'd place it on the finished face interior, which means that this little orange wall, um, you just have to move it to the inside. Next would be on uh, simplicity. So you would keep everything simple, even your roofs, your floors. Um, and uh, as you go all the way up, you've got your shafts, you've got your cores. Again, these are very important to, to hold everything together. It holds a, a core of your building. Um, you don't want to do too many jogs and too many you know, edges or bulkheads or too much fancy stuff. Um, it just gets uh, cumbersome, gets hard to manage, and uh, you kind of lose track of it. So, uh, and those small details, you've got to use your judgment. Um, if it, is it really going to make an impact in the energy model? If not, then I'd probably drop it. Um, but I see here you've got, uh, you can see the yellow line. That's what actually appears as the analytical line. So once you have a good understanding of where that is and, um, and how it's going to appear, then you know, there is no really second guessing. I don't really wonder where that integration is going to be. I, I know where it's going to be because I positioned it at a very accurate place. And so even when you have uh, roofs and floors and, and exterior walls here joining together, um, it's nothing to worry about. But when you have these different um, thicknesses, then you, you really, you, you're not sure where it's going to happen. Then you get these errors and you're not really sure why. Um, so this is why. Um, the precision, you've got to be very, very precise. Um, sometimes a few millimeters can, can create errors. So um, this is uh, the bottom left. You see there's a vestibule and, and corridors. Um, if I blow it up, you can see I've used these reference planes to, to indicate that everything in here is converging right to the center. Um, I know it might get a little bit ugly, architecturally speaking, but uh, it'll work very well in the energy model, um, simply because that's how the software is recognizing things. So GBXML doesn't really care about how pretty your model is. It just wants to know, you know, right down to the millimeter, where is everything converging to that point. And if you're able to do that, you're able to to, to make it work very predictably. Um, I even have a space separation line that kind of merges itself in here. Um, if, you, if you were to put that space separation line in the middle of the curtain wall, it would split that curtain wall and it would kind of make a, a crack in it, which is still fine. Um, I just have to fix it after the fact. But if you, if you position it right here in the middle, it doesn't really create an error visually. So very, very precise. Um, completeness, like, like uh, Dave was mentioning, you need to fill up every space with, um, or every volume with a space. Um, and sometimes you've got these, um, you know, these plenums or these exterior plenums. Um, this shading surface here will not appear until there's a space in here. That's how the GBXML process recognizes, um, you know, what's, what's around it, you know, if, um, what surfaces are around it and, and how it's adjoined and adjacent to things. So sometimes you might have to create these, these small little, you know, level 1.9 uh, create a level on it, create a floor and a, and a wall, and put a space in it, and just, you know, it'll just work fine. And finally, the last is the hierarchy or a structure. So I typically like to use some sort of structure that uh, starts off from the exterior wall and curtain walls, um, and then works its way to cores and shafts and interior walls. Mainly that is because that, you know, once you see here at the bottom right, you, you start off with an exterior wall, which is, it can be the finished face exterior or interior. Um, but this core wall and the interior wall all be dependent on where that is. So as long as you have this dependency, then, then you know that things are lining up um, above and beyond and, and all around. So this core wall, you can see these dark purple, those, those walls go all the way down, maybe two, three floors. Um, as for the, the red and, and that green wall, might go up and above, you know, even beyond. So it's it's good to keep that structure so that you know that everything is going to just gel together um, when it when it comes together. So finally, now we've uh, we you know, hopefully built the entire geometry by now, um, so to speak, and uh, and then you get to the integration process. So you can um, use the GBXML process to import all this information. Um, but I find GBXML is simply one mechanism into the whole process, and, uh, and the other mechanisms would be exchanging information via Excel, um, and, uh, but uh, 
So how it typically starts off is that when you bring in a GPXML file, um, it flattens out the existing model and erases your templates. Uh, it also prevents you from performing iterations. So I typically export this information out to a geometry file, a gem file, which is a, a, a format from the VE um, that exports just a clean uh, geometry file. So this helps you isolate these, um, these new or modified building components and you're able to move those across very easily. So it's a way of kind of polishing off the GBXML file, which is typically, a, I find, a dirty process or has a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't you don't really need. So, um, so it just makes it a little bit easier to move information across. Uh, but then again, we got space schedules that those can be exported through Excel, and those space schedules can embed a lot of information, and and uh, they're very very quick to move across. So. That's where it's kind of, as long as you use your two mechanisms, GBXML and Excel, then you'll get everything across no problem. But you can't just simply rely only on GBXML. And uh, this is kind of the only slide I've got on energy modeling. Um, the whole goal of this whole process is to get to an energy simulation, get there quickly, um, and be able to compare your results um, you know, from multiple iterations. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the whole goal is to keep your, your source of information from BIM accurate and be able to update your models so that you can provide quick uh, feedback through Excel and through the whole uh, BIM process. Now, if you've got um, existing 3D models, which I think is the state of you know, most of the people right now, you know, you've got these, these models from your architects, um, you don't know what to do with them, uh, there's a few ways to adapt them. You can use the techniques that I've shown you, the, the five modeling techniques to, uh, to fix up small and simple projects. Um, I'd only recommend this for, for advanced users after you've done the whole process once. Um, you, can, you can kind of adapt buildings because it's a little bit harder to adapt them than to build them from scratch. Um, also an easy way is to export all the CAD to uh, or the, the model to CAD and build it back up kind of a house of cards so that way it's kind of not in your way and you're able to, uh, to chisel out the parts that you want and you need. Um, because architecturally speaking, in, in a coordination, clash detection type of way, it's too much information to reduce it down to uh, something that works. So now into the level two. Um, so this is the data exchange process. This is what you know is going to help you achieve that level two um, UK standard. But uh, so I've, I've done some information, some work with Building Smart, um, and uh, and they define. Um, level two, or not level two, they, they define the, uh, what they call it a view, a model view definition. And so the energy simulation view um, serves as a specific purpose of capturing information from buildings to calculate energy usage and derived energy ratings. So this uh, is a little more detailed. I think it's probably more at the end of the line, kind of a, your compliance reporting, even operations and energy auditing. It's kind of closer to that level. Um, but one thing that you can use to, you know, to, to drive this is that at some point you will need to get all that information into your model, whether, whether it is for your compliance report or for your um, energy auditing or measurement and verification or whatever it may be, that stuff needs to come down from them into energy modeling and, and vice versa. So um, IFC is, uh, is the interoperable standard for Open BIM. Um, I've been using the, uh, the IFC4 data dictionary to define my parameters inside Revit so that they're they're the ones that everyone's using across the whole world. So, you know, I'm in Canada, you guys are going to be, you know, anywhere. Um, we're all going to be speaking the same language. So that's kind of the, the common environment that we're trying to create. So some of you may have seen this before. Uh, this is the bi-directional data exchange workflow. Um, so overall, I'm just going to run this through this quickly. Um, but we start off with the Revit project. And, uh, and this is where we are able to create these parameters inside the project or inside space parameters, so to speak. Um, but any sort of components, pumps, fans, whatever you want, um, you can customize these. And uh, so the next part of the process, you import this into the virtual environment. In the virtual environment, you've seen that I've opened up the, oh, sorry, moved around. You've, you've opened up the uh, tabular room data. And this is what you can use to, uh, to export back and forth to, you know, back into the, the Revit project. Um, I've taken a, an extra step here in the middle to, uh, as I call it, a data sorting spreadsheet. Uh, this is when you get into detailed HVAC. 
um, and not using Apache SIM. So when you want to use Apache HVAC, then you get into zone-based modeling, um, and it gets a little messy there, so you have to kind of clean it up. But overall, we've got the BIM import-export tools. Um, Doug has mentioned one. I've used BIM Link, um, and now I'm starting to use Autodesk Dynamo. So that's a free open source tool or free on subscription with Revit. Um, so if you have Revit, then you can use Dynamo. And that's a great tool for, for many other things. So I'll talk a little more about that in a second. Um, to just kind of cover the data sorting spreadsheet, um, just to kind of demystify it, um, how it works is that we've got, um, when you export your, your, your V information from the HPAC, um, you export in, in terms of zones and then by internal space ID, um, which you can see gets a little bit confusing when, when you start importing your model from Revit and especially when you start iterating your model, then your internal space ID starts to get very different and then it starts to losing making sense. Um, so once you, you can export this information out of, of the VE, you're able to create an internal list. And so I just usually create a list um, as you export your data. You can just create a list from one to you know a thousand, however many species you have. Then you sort this data back using space numbers, and space numbers is going to be similar from the VE to Revit. So as long as you have a similar um, title, then you're able to move information right across as a copy paste, and uh, and that information gets populated into, into the schedules, and then away it goes. Um, if you wanted to vice versa, bring it back in, um, you would do the same space numbers, and then you would resort it by IES IDs, and then you're able to copy and paste it back into the VE. So it works both ways, um, but this is a little bit of a small process to do in the middle. So back in, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Revit process, or the, uh, the sorry, the Dynamo process. Um, so this is not something that I've created, although I, um, I've taken it from online. There's a guy from Arc Smarter. There's a link down here on YouTube. Um, and he, defined, he, he explains to you how to create this entire process, which is great. Um, so this is a, in, in the Dynamo environment. Those who don't know Dynamo, it's a visual programming tool that's uh, connected directly into Revit. Um, and it allows you to select and edit parameters or, or basically select any component that you'd want from inside Revit and, uh, and create kind of a programming language for it. So I'll break down, this is the first half. Um, this is the write writing half. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but again, you can see more information on that YouTube video if you really want to. Um, you start off at the top left, you, got, you select your spaces, your space parameter or category in here. Um, then it breaks it down into these, these large lists. Then you're able to isolate each uh, parameter type. So then you grab the, the see so I got three parameters, I got name, number, design HVAC load. Uh, then it breaks, then it lists off these this information. Then you create a list. So you, you grab the list, you transpose it in together, and then you're able to excel right to the file. So then you can write um, a file on your desktop. Um, so then you're able to take that information, copy paste it into into uh, the VE, or in this case, you can grab information from the VE, and now you can start to write it. So this is the second half. So these blue lines here, you would simply connect or disconnect depending on what you're doing, reading or writing. Uh, if you're reading from Excel, you want to read information from the VE and copy and paste back into uh, the Revit. Then uh, this top half is just simply the opposite of what we just started, but it, it uh, breaks up the list and then it re-isolates it per, um, per parameter. Um, so what I've done is I've created a Revit template for energy modeling. So those of you who've tried to edit the parameters or the space parameters in Revit, you'll notice that you can't edit them. Um, I don't know why, but, um, but anyways, I've created my own space templates, and, uh, and these templates are uh, correlated with the, you know, can be correlated with the ASHRAE 90.1 whatever version you want, 27 or 2007 or 2010, or even uh, high performance guidelines or whatever it might be, or the National Energy Code for Canada. Um, but what I've done here is I've you know, embedded these uh, three key schedules, which are your lighting, your people, and your miscellaneous loads. And, uh, and right in here, you can see in the properties tab, um, I've kind of redefined new, new parameters inside my space templates where I'm able to create um, as much information as I want, uh, customize the customize these however I want, and I can correlate this information directly to the VE um, so that it's a quick copy-paste 
And uh, if, if a space changes or it gets edited or updated, um, then you have this information here, and this gets broken down to your all your spaces in your Revit model. Uh, so that's kind of a core element as to how to move information across. So we're just about to wrap up, so I just want to recap real quick. Um, so we started off, we did an introduction of the DEM for interoperability concept. Um, then we moved into techniques that you can apply to all your projects that will improve your integration process. And then I, uh, we talked about how to use this in the energy modeling process within the design process. So um, in conclusion, if you wanted to get started with the BIM integration process, um, we've got uh, an online course, an online on-demand course um, available at trailip.com. Um, this course helps you, you know, break down every single step. Um, of the, mo the majority of it is you know, teaching you how to use Revit for this specific integration process in order to, uh, to mitigate all the errors um, before getting into the IS virtual environment. Um, and so, you know, the intent of this is that we can, we can share it with, with architects, with engineers, so whoever is doing the model, um, they can learn the process, they can save time. Um, it takes about a few days to go through the course, but then once you're done, you're able to create um, your own projects. Um, so we've got uh, a success story, uh, which is what I'm thrilled to, to share. Uh, so it's, it's Michael from Europe Happold, um, and he was a student in, in Germany. So um, we, we didn't meet yet, but uh, he was able to go through the course and, uh, and build this model from, you know, and this, I think this is the second model. This first one was just as good. Um, and so it was able to create these models and, you know, have 100% accuracy. So these, this, all this information is translated across. And uh, as long as you're using this process, then you're able to make it work. So this is something that, uh, you know, no matter where you are, you know, I can guarantee it um, that you're able to, uh, to use this program to uh, make any project work. So um, if, you, if you'd like to sign up, um, I've got a, I can run a promotion by the end of the week. Um, so if you sign up by the end of the week, by January 31st, um, you can use this, this discount code, um, which will give you a discounted price of 139. Um, U.S. dollars. Um, we'll include the uh, the ebook, um, the customizable Reddit template, and also we've got some brand new detailed process diagrams. These are fresh off the press from uh, about a week ago. Um, so we've got these these diagrams that will help you break down every step of the process, and, uh, and we're including all this stuff inside the course so that um, that you can get started and kind of excel forward um, directly into your level two BIM with energy modeling. Uh, if you're interested in academic training, we've got, uh, we offer a 50% off discount for students and educators. Um, if you'd like to incorporate this into your program, so we've got, uh, we've got an example, we've got a 15-week program for post-secondary schools. Um, we right now we've got two schools right now in, in Toronto and in Ottawa, and we've got an academic collaborator for our, the research in Montreal. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy to work with as many schools as we can to drive this, this forward and get as many collaborators so that, um, you know, we can advance this, this industry. So I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for staying on this long. And uh, if you'd like to um, have access to these uh, slides, it'll be available on Twitter, on my um, Twitter account, at Trailip on, the, on there. So here's my contact information, um, my phone number, my email. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And, uh, yeah. Thanks.